Hello and welcome to our podcast, Earth Day Every Day. I'm Vivian. And I'm Ori Bateson. And today we're talking about all things chilly, looking, in, looking into the Canadian Arctic region, how it's changing at an alarming rate and what this means for social and legal aspects. Helping out with our journey into the Arctic, we have various specialists, including ourselves, who dedicate their research to this vast Arctic region. Introducing Rose Farr. Hi, I'm excited to be here. Tara Teaton. Hey guys, it's great to be speaking with you. And Greg Van Steen. Hey guys, thanks for having me. And Carly Christensen. Hi guys, thanks for having me. Great to have you all here. Now Rose, mine and your research is very closely linked to what we both look into. How the Canadian Arctic is going to achieve going to change and adapt as we move into the future, but could you just give us a brief description of the region and set the scene before we dive into the main topics for discussion? Of course, so the Canadian Arctic is an important location to look at when discussing climate change due to its unique environment, with snow making it 80% of the precipitation annually. In Canada, the Arctic makes up 40% of the total land mass, which is underlaid by a layer of permafrost. This is ground that has been frozen for two years or longer. However, due to climate change, the permafrost has been melting. So why should we be worried about this? The reason for my concern is because the environment is very fragile and susceptible for the impacts of climate change. Observed levels of snow precipitation have already decreased and on average, Canada's annual average temperature has warmed an estimated 1.7 degrees Celsius since 1948, whereas northern Canada's increase was approximately 2.3 degrees Celsius. This is amplified due to the decrease in albedo effect. The sun's energy, which would usually be reflected off the light surfaces of snow and ice, is now being absorbed by the darker surfaces revealed as the snow and ice melts, therefore increasing the surface temperature. This is known as polar amplification. So, if the Canadian Arctic is warming, is that having a significant effect on the environment? Yes, it is. With the Arctic warming at a rate twice as fast as the global average, the environment is changing in some major ways. Firstly, as Rose mentioned, sea ice is melting rapidly and is being replaced by thin ice that is vulnerable to melting fully in the summer months. Glaciers are also retreating, and the meltwater this produces changes the regional hydrology, meaning that the surrounding rivers and any life they support undergo significant changes. Wow, it's hard to imagine life being able to withstand these changes. What will happen to the animal species there? For many species in the marine ecosystem use the ice as the platform for resting, reproducing and feeding. And these species are highly threatened by the current ice loss, resulting in significant population declines which are projected to continue. Furthermore, in response to sea ice loss, ship traffic has almost tripled in the last decade, and by 2030 the Northwest Passage will likely be ice-free during summer. Despite the opportunities this brings, I personally think this will be very damaging for the region because increased shipping activity breaks up the ice, increases marine pollution, and disturbs migration routes for Arctic species, which increases pressure on Arctic animals and affects fish availability, abundance, and health. Wait a minute, the glacial metal caused sea levels to rise? Unfortunately, yes, and this projected sea level rise will change Canada's coastline through coastal erosion and flooding. Plus, currently the area of permafrost in the Arctic is shrinking, and it is expected that the thawing of permafrost will further accelerate climate change, because it will release carbon that is usually locked up within the permafrost to the atmosphere in the form of methane. So the amount of greenhouse gas contributing to global warming will increase. But Izzy, you are more knowledgeable on this issue of thawing permafrost. Can you give us more insight on this, please? So, with mean annual temperatures expected to rise 4 to 7 degrees Celsius in the next century, not only are glaciers retreating and thinning, but permafrost is melting and pollinators are expanding. This will be ch touched on later. Melting permafrost creates a huge threat in terms of greenhouse gases like methane that are released into the atmosphere as a result, leading to increased global warming. This creates a positive feedback loop where global warming is already creating a melting of ice and permafrost. With greenhouse gases being released as a result of this, it leads to even further global warming. So, what exactly are pollinators? So, pollinators are areas of ocean from water surrounded by sea ice that are especially important for marine and bird life. Although there is a vast lack in quantitative data to analyse the ecological processes and balances unique to these habitats. If Penendis continue to expand, this will allow the passing of ships and commercial fishing boats through the Northwest Passage, as previously mentioned by Tara. 
This creates a threat to Arctic fish stocks as well as petrochemical exploration from ships, which also have ice breaking capabilities. What are the main effects on marine life? So, a really sad future effect is that of heavy metal contaminants on Arctic marine mammals. These, along with added nutrients as a result of human influence, enter the water and lead to traces of substances such as mercury being found in the flesh and blubber of marine mammals like the beluga, ringed seal, and Arctic char. An area of interest is how the changing environments are affecting the animal population. Rory, if you could possibly elaborate on what these changes are and how it's going to impact the region as a whole. Yes, so we're seeing constant fluctuations of sea ice extent as a result of seasonal changes. As the region warms in the summer months, melting away the thinner ice which resides towards the south of the Canadian Arctic. These changes are having a greater effect year on year with pivotal natural cycles from whale migration to phytoplankton production and are therefore having impacts on the environment which may not be reversible if the current warming scenario is maintained. Are there any particular species at a greater risk? Well, as Tara briefly mentioned, many Arctic species are under threat from the changing Arctic environment, but in particular, ring seals, a species that inhabits the region as well as circumpolar and acts as a food source for the local Inuit population. It is hard to assess population change of Arctic species as there are limited baseline population estimates, and so gauging this change is difficult. However, there is research that focuses on future predictions, such as the one written by Rima et al., which estimates that median population decline ranges from 50 to 99% until the year 2100. So why is the population decreasing? Environmental change can be classified into environmental stresses. For example, the early breakup of ice in the spring and reduced snow depth play a pivotal role in ring seal pup survival. The species are an ice obligate, meaning they rely on the sea ice for pupping, nursing and molting, as well as relying on an abundance of snow, which is used to build layers for pupping and feeding. At present, as we move into the future, this ice which seals rely on will become either too weak to sustain the population or simply not exist at all as their habitat declines as a result of the region warming and they become under threat from increased predation. This change in ring seal population is not unique and we are seeing declines and changes in behaviour of multiple species within the region, a worrying thought given the current rate of extinction across the whole globe and this particular species population change is beginning to have knock-on effects within the human populace. A grey area for myself, but luckily Rose can probably begin to provide us with a clearer image of what the Inuit culture is like within the region. So, although only 1% of Canada's population live within the Canadian Arctic, more than half of these are Indigenous, with a total of 53 communities across the northern region of Canada. Inuit groups traditionally live off of hunting on sea mammals, fish and caribou, which are wild reindeer. The population of the Canadian Arctic, particularly the Inuit communities, are being directly impacted by the changes caused by climate change, such as changes in traditional methods of hunting passed down through generations. Carly, please could you give us a deeper insight into how and why they are being affected? They have an abundance of potential prey, mostly Arctic fish, such as char, but do hunt large prey like seals and caribou. As you mentioned, Rose, however, due to environmental change, it is becoming a greater challenge to obtain this food. As such, the Inuit people are moving away from country foods to a more commercial source, resulting in a large change in their diet and therefore impacting their health as they require certain nutrients such as zinc to be able to survive in this harsh environment. It is even more important to remain healthy as their access to health care is limited as the ice is melting, which limits helicopter and snowmobile use. If they are moving away from country foods, what are they consuming now? A lot of their food is now purchased in supermarkets, which in itself contributes to climate change, as it has to be produced and transported to these remote locations, furthering the effect of climate change within this region. Not only are their ways of life, such as hunting and survival, affected, but they are threatened on a much deeper level. Their mental health and spiritual health are becoming more threatened. Without being able to hunt, which is a big part of their cultural practices, they are at a higher risk for things like disease outbreaks. Other effects are things like exposure to mold and the water quality lessening with the increasing chemical and microbial contamination. The rate of mortality is also increasing from things like food insecurity and mobile accidents that are more common as the ice melts and the thickness is uncertain. Greg, could you give us an overview of how the geopolitical issues are infecting the Inuit? The warming in the Canadian Arctic is bringing up major geopolitical issues that our world leaders will have to address in the near future. 
new trans Arctic and shipping lanes are becoming more viable as a result of climate and change. These routes include the Northwest Pass and Inch and North Sea Route. In previous years, these passages have been unreliable due to the region's unpredictable weather conditions and were generally considered impassable. But in recent years, the ice has diminished in the region and a renewed interest has been taken up in the region. So what is the big deal about the Northwest Passage and the Northern Sea Route? World leaders are realizing the opportunities that these new shipping routes provide, such as reducing transit time for shipping, resource extraction up the oil, increased military activity in the region, fishing and tourism. So will the Northwest Passage and Northern Sea Route increase crime in the region, do you think? Yes, the openings of the Northwest Passage and North Sea Route put the Arctic states at a higher risk of transcontinental crimes. Illegal fishing, illicit trafficking, and drug trafficking could take place on these passages if unknown ships pack through them. Okay, and who has control over the Northwest Passage and the Northern Sea Route? The sovereignty of the Northwest Passage and North Sea Route are not been resolved. Canada believes that the Northwest Passage is located within Canada's internal waters, so any ship that passes through it is subject to Canadian law and sovereignty. This is the same for Russia and the North Sea Route, which they believe will have to defend their territorial waters. Russia and Canada recognize each other's claim of the sovereignty over the North Sea Route, the Northwest Passage. The United States and European Union disagree with Canada's claim to sovereignty and claim that the Northwest Pack City is the international strait. This will likely occur with the North Sea Route as Russia and China continue to develop the North Sea Rail. Thanks for that, Greg. Unfortunately, we're coming to the end of our journey into the Canadian Arctic. I myself have found it interesting learning about the different aspects which are intertwined with one another and how fragile this harsh environment really is. Yes, there definitely is some food for thought, especially having our friends from across the pond, Greg Van Steen and Carly Christensen, give us an educated look into the social processes of the region. Thank you both for joining us. And I'd like to thank our guests, Rose Bart and Tara Tim. Thank you for having us. It was a pleasure. Thank you. On behalf of us here at Earth Day Every Day, thanks for listening and we'll see you again soon.